This week for my game of D&D, I needed a scene where a bridge crossed over a river. I didn't have one, so that meant that I needed to make one. So that's what we're gonna be doing this week on the Storycraft Society. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. My name is Garmin. This, of course, is the Storycraft Society, and this week we are going to be working on a bridge that I needed for my game. You remember a couple of weeks ago when I said, when you're crafting and you have to craft terrain, it takes all the fun out of it. At least for me, it takes that joy of making something away and puts a timer on it. When you're crafting and you have to craft terrain, it takes all the fun out of it. It takes all the fun out of it. I'm off that. Honestly, it's one of those things where I have a pendulum that swings back and forth where I really like crafting under pressure and then I get burnt out on it and then I just wanna do something that has absolutely no pressure over it and that back and forth is just a constant cycle that I'm always in. I'm sure that it's kind of unhealthy or something that I really get a rush off of crafting under pressure, but you know, it's what I do and it's what keeps me making stuff for my game every week. It is what it is. I don't think it's going to make me become a better crafter to do it that way and it absolutely can lead to burnout, but I just keep finding myself falling back into the I have to get this done by X day thing, and that's how I get a lot of stuff done. But that's what happened this past week, and I really do enjoy the challenge sometimes. Back to what I needed this week. What I needed for my game was an encounter site where there would be two banks on either side of a river with a big bridge over the center of it. And I don't have a bridge that's that big. I knew that I was going to need this encounter next week, so I started on the Friday after my Thursday game, and that would give me Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, seven days to get it crafted and get it to my table. So let's jump into it. This is what I did. So to get started on this project, I broke out my XPS foam. Now I broke out a bunch of scrap pieces that I had in slightly bigger sizes. And what I did was two larger pieces, those would be the banks, and then one smaller, thinner piece that was going to be the bridge. I laid them out in a way so I could see like a quick, just blocky idea of what the final product was going to look like. And then the first thing that I did was I made a paper template in order to draw the curve that I wanted for the bridge. I went for the flattest curve that I could so that miniatures would stand up easy on it. With that said, I really was pleased with the curve that I got. I'm not sure exactly how to say how to recreate it because I, I just kind of drew and made it as flat as I could where it still looked curvy if that makes any sense. But the important thing is, is that what I did was I took that template and used it to help me sketch out what the sides of the bridge would look like onto a piece of foam core. Now to get my curved lines, like my archways and stuff underneath right, I got creative and I used a bunch of different random items that were around my house. So for example, I used this can of condensed milk and I used a bit of a paint palette just so that I could find easier ways to find the curves and then be the size that I wanted them to be. For me, it was a way of saving myself time and effort that I could just find something that already had the curve that I wanted instead of trying to draw it and sketch it out by hand and potentially get it wrong. Work smarter, not harder, as I always say. Now, I only drew that onto one piece of foam core. So what I could do was cut it out and then that was a template that I used onto another piece of foam core to make sure that the two pieces were exactly the same. With them done, I could set them up on either side of my piece of XPS and I could start to see what the bridge would look like once it's done. To make the internal core of the bridge, what I needed was more XPS, something that went all the way down to my table. So I took out another block of XPS and I cut it to the same size as the first one and glued that down onto the bottom. For this, I wanted to use hot glue, but it was too big of an area and the hot glue would have dried too quickly. So what I ended up doing was using just regular old PVA glue, put those together and put books on top of them to let them dry. And while it was drying, I moved off to the next thing, which was working on the bank pieces. 
So to start the banks, I chose the roughest of the four sides of my bank pieces, and then I cut a cliff face into it. I actually took a tin foil ball and textured all over that cliff face area and just on the edges of it to get that ready to move on. The rest of the three sizes I left totally blank. I didn't texture them at all because they can actually get painted black at the very end of the process. And then that will make them disappear off into the table and just seem like it's not part of the scene, which will be brighter and more colorful and draw your eye more. Also, I left the back of the piece totally square. That way I could take and turn the pieces around and I could have them meet up and then it would end up making a grass slash road board. Just a way of making this piece a little bit more versatile and something that I could get multiple uses out of, not just the one bridge over the river scene. It's definitely one of those things where I try to make things as multi-purpose as I can. And this was just a simple way that I saw of being able to get more than one use out of my two bank pieces. In order for the road to meet up, I needed to make sure that the road basically started on the same place on both. So what I ended up doing was taking a marker and just drawing a line to guarantee that the road did meet up. And then I started to put down a layer of Eileen's tacky glue and sand. That's gonna get me my sandy road texture. Back to the bridge. Once the blocks for the bridge were dry, I used my foam core to trace out the shapes of what was going to go on either side. And then I cut that piece out so that it looked like the core shape of the bridge. Now what's really important to mention is that the foam core needs to stand up about three quarters of an inch taller than where the walking surface of the bridge will be. That's going to make it so that there are walls that run on either side of the bridge. Now using sewing pins and Eileen's tacky glue, I attached the foam to either side of my XPS core. The reason that I like to use the pins here is because when you just use the glue, it's easy for it to shift or get a little bit off of where you originally place it. And the pins just make it very easy and guarantee me that where I glue it is exactly where it's going to stay. You know it, you love it, that means more PVA glue, so now we have to wait for the foam core to dry with the bridge. All dry times, this whole project, all dry times. Back to the banks. With the sand for the road all dry, basically that meant that the sculpt was done on the banks. These were very easy and quick to make because there wasn't a whole lot of moving pieces with them. So what that meant was it was time to move on to Black Magic Craft base coat and paint. For those who don't know, Black Magic Craft base coat is just a 50-50 mixture of black acrylic craft paint and matte Mod Podge, and I'm gonna use that to go over the entire piece. That really locks all of the sand in place, not letting it flake off, as well as gives a little bit of extra strength to my foam, but that's going to go over the entire thing, and then it's time to move on to paint. The banks are gonna have two areas that need separate colors of paint. One is gonna be the dirt, the other is going to be the road. Now I'm gonna be painting both of these basically the same way, except I'm gonna be using different colors for the dirt than I am for the road, obviously. And we're gonna start with the dirt. So for the dirt, I'm gonna be using three colors here. I'm gonna be using burnt umber, a brown, and then I'm going to finish that up with a honey brown. I'm gonna start by covering all of the dirt surfaces in that burnt umber. I'm gonna go over basically the whole thing with a pretty wet brush to make sure that I get down into the nooks and crannies, but that's gonna go everywhere except for the road. I followed that up with a dry brush of the brown. And then what's important here is I only went over the areas where I think the flock is not going to cover. I followed that up lastly with the dry brushing of the honey brown and I went over the same areas that I did with the brown in the second step. And once I did that, the dirt was all done. Time to move on to the road. The colors that I'm gonna be using on the road are a territorial beige, followed by a khaki, and then lastly, a dry brushing of antique white. So I'm going to start by taking the territorial beige all over where the road is. I'm gonna do my best to try to blend this out into the dirt on the sides, that way it looks nice and natural. And then I'm going to do a dry brushing over the whole road in the khaki, followed up by a dry brushing over the whole road in the antique white. And that's it. The banks are now painted up and ready for flock. So real quick before we dive into the flocks, the three colors of flock we're gonna be using are Woodland Scenic's Green Blend, my Storycraft Blend, and then we're gonna be using a fine light green from Flock and Turf. Now recently it's been pointed out to me by a subscriber that when I explain my story blend, I say that it's one part woodland earth, one part woodland burnt, and one part woodland dry. Dry grass doesn't exist. I don't know how I came up with that, uh, but the actual one is yellow grass. So I use the fine turf of the earth, the burnt grass and the dry 
yellow grass. Almost did it again. And that's how I end up with my Storycraft blend. And I feel like it's a little bit more natural than the three of these and I can spread it around a little quicker this way. But with that said, let's jump into flocking. So the process for this is pretty simple. I covered it in depth. If you go to my Epic Hill video and I think all the way back in the beginning of the channel with the Goblin Eras Ambush series. But in a nutshell, what I'm gonna do is lay down a layer of Eileen's Tacky Glue anywhere where I would like my grass flock to be. I follow that up by covering the whole area where I put the glue down with Green Blend from Woodland Scenics. And then I spray over that whole thing with isopropyl alcohol. What the isopropyl alcohol is gonna do is allow the glue to saturate quicker down into the foam and make it get harder once it finishes drying. The next thing is going to be to take my Storycraft Society blend and sprinkle that all over to give some variance to the color of the grass. And then lastly, I'm going to sprinkle little tiny bits of the fine green to make like dandelion looking flowers all over my flock. Really easy to do and it always turns out super, super well. But now we're gonna lock it down in place. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a very watered down PVA glue. I'm using Elmer's here because it's easier to water down than Eileen's Tacky Glue, and I'm going to saturate it. And when I say saturate it, I mean it almost turns white with how much glue that I put on it. I put so much glue that it is just on the edge of running off the edge of the piece. That's what's gonna make all of that flock saturate with glue and soak all the way down and lock super tight so that it basically becomes like almost concrete on top of your piece. With that done, then I move that off to the side and I let it dry. Yay, more dry time. Woohoo! Bridge time. So now that the bridge was dry, I started working on the bridge, getting all of the detailing work done. I'm gonna start by gluing all of the big blocks that are like the supports for all of the arches, and then the big crests that are gonna go on the side and the little pillars that go beside those. This was something that I didn't really think about too much other than I just glued down what looked nice in the moment. There's things that I would change now if I could go back and do that, but that's not really the point. What I was doing is trying to get this bridge done and ready for my game, so I did what felt right in the moment, and then if I make another bridge later, I can make it even better than this one. Now, an interesting trick that I went with this time was I broke out all of the spare pieces of brick that I had, stuff from various different projects, bricks that were never supposed to go together. If you textured them all up and then start gluing them on, what you're gonna get is a really haphazard and non-uniform result. It makes them look a little bit more old and antique, and I also didn't have to spend time cutting bricks. Now I will say this took a while, but I love gluing bricks. Not actually sarcasm, I really do like gluing bricks down. So I just got set in and glued until it was done. And it's so much fun for me to watch the brick textures come to life as you're gluing them in. Maybe that's why I think the brick is so much fun for me to do. Even though they're little teeny tiny bricks and it is a little tedious sometimes, it's so much fun to see the piece immediately come to life in a way that a lot of the other steps just don't give you. Now, when I got to the very top, I let the bricks run wild. I did this on purpose because it would be easier to clean them up later than to get each one cut to the exact size that it needed to be now. By the time it dried, more, more dry, dry time. time just went across the top with a knife very carefully. And when I say this, I'm gonna say this again. Please, if you're doing this step, be very, very careful. Do not get impatient. Go really nice and slow, A, and most importantly, to make sure you don't hurt yourself. But B, you can use the foam core as a guide to get you to cut exactly the shape of the foam core. But more importantly, be careful so that you don't cut yourself or do something that would hurt yourself. To cap the upper edge, what I did was I cut out some thinner, more square blocks, and then I just took my hot glue gun out and just boop, 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 right down the line and glued them in place. Because I was working in hot glue, I just felt like Speed Racer running these things across the top, working in PVA for the rest of the project. It's just amazing how much hot glue really does speed up the process on certain applications. Now, one thing that I'll mention about what I did on the piece at this stage is I started by gluing these caps down on either end and work to the top. That way, if there was a piece that needed to be trimmed, it ended up in the top and not where I wanted all four of my bottoms to match. So with that done, I really wanted to sneak a peek of what this was going to look like. The basic shape of the bridge was done, the banks were finished. What I needed to do was to set it all up and look at it. But 
Unfortunately, I had to wait a bit for the flock to dry. All right, so it's been a couple of days and honestly, my flock normally takes about 24 hours to dry. It's been three days, three whole massive days that I've been sitting around waiting for this to dry. I don't understand it. Maybe it's just cause like it's humid outside or something, I don't know. But for whatever reason, this took forever to dry. But it is dry now, so take that as a lesson on patience with your flock. If it takes a long time to dry, be patient because it will dry eventually. The plan that I've had all along was to go down this with a knife. So it is time to do that. It makes me a little nervous, so wish me luck. And here we go, fresh new blade. Let's see how this goes. So very carefully, I cut between the two pieces with my Alpha knife. Uh, like I said, I had a brand new blade on this and I went really, really, really slow. Uh, but all I can say is, holy moly, I think it worked. Amazing, let's go. Bam! Boy, did this turn out awesome. I mean, it's better than I could have hoped for it to, the way that it lines up. If you put them forwards, it looks really great with the bridge, but when you put it backwards, like literally the line in the flock disappears. I, I just couldn't be more pleased with that. You can see the line in the road and that's a little frustrating. I probably could have done something a little better to make sure that that line was a little less obvious, but the flock is just absolutely perfect. I did get the opportunity once it was all dry to set the whole project up and look at it and get an idea. And needless to say, at this stage, I was stoked. But stoked as I was, I still had work to do, so let's knock this thing out. Now I dropped glue all over the top of the walkway of the bridge and then put sand all over that. The reason is because obviously I want it to match my road and that's exactly what I did with my roads. So of course I let that dry, more dry time of course, and then I tapped that off and then it was time to move on to Mod Podge. All right, so now that we're on to the Mod Podge step, let's talk about brush choice for a second. I have two brushes here, one that's a flat brush and one that's an angled brush. When I'm doing something that has a lot of holes and divots and stuff in it, Brick is a fantastic example of that. I like to go with a pointed brush and this might make sense to a lot of people, but it's one of those things where when I figured it out, it saved me a lot of time and effort. So onward and upward, Let's get this all Mod Podged. All right, so with the Mod Podge all done, it is time to move on to the painting process. So I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to do a little bit of a heart to heart with all of you because I would like to know what is working in my videos and what I could do better on. So in this video, I'm gonna just skip over the painting process. The reason is because I know that the painting process is the weakest part of my whole process. And so I feel like me explaining the same three color paint job over and over and over again every week gets annoying or is just redundant and it's unnecessary and I could be filling the videos with more useful information. So I would like for everybody who has an opinion to sound off down in the comments, I would appreciate it greatly, but just let me know. Do you want me to explain my painting process every week? Or do you want me to just touch on little pieces of it? Or would you rather me just skip over to the glamour shots because it's not that useful? Whatever will make the most engaging and interesting videos is what I'm in the market for. So uh, if you can, just leave it in the comments below. All right, let's check out some glamour shots. Surprise! Actually, uh, in the middle of painting this, I realized about this point. In fact, I don't know if this is halfway through, but it's at a point uh, where it's kind of in the middle of it. But I do have something important to say about it. And um, I'm gonna break that down right now because that is what I'm doing with this YouTube video. Uh, <clears throat> this take is going great so far, by the way. Now, normally when I paint my stonework, this is here now, I paint a gray and then I paint my accents in like a creamy tan kind of a mix. I've got an issue though. With my bridge here, I have a creamy tan for my road. That means if I painted this, in a creamy tan, then it would blend too much in with my road and wouldn't pop enough. What I've decided that I'm going to do, mix some colors, and I'm gonna kind of walk through that process because I think that that is valuable. On the fly, mixing and changing what you're going to do is both important and a really uh, useful skill, and that is it. So, let's jump into it. So all across the piece, I did this charcoal gray by Americana as my you know base coat over the whole thing. 
the next step that I need to do is my mid-tone. Now, my normal mid-tone is this Pewter Gray by Apple Barrel. What I'm going to do is actually take that and I'm going to cut it with this Territorial Beige. That's going to end up making a little bit of an accent color that's obviously going to stand off of my regular gray, but it's going to stand off of the beige that was my undercoat on here. So let's start with that. So with that done, you can see just that little bit. It's got some diversity there, and it also has some diversity from my gray. So then I'm going to go up one more step, and I'm going to do that same exact thing, but I'm going to mix a khaki and my pewter gray, and then that'll be my highest highlight. So now what I end up with is a color that is unique from the beige and kind of tannish uh, road, but also a unique color from the gray, but the colors are all born of the same palette, right? So they all work together. So anyway, I'm gonna knock this out and then I'll show you what it looks like. Then it will be glamour shots. But as I got to set this set up to get ready for my Thursday game, it just kind of overwhelmed me with how pleased I was with how this turned out. I mean, just everything from the multi-purpose use of the banks all the way up to how just absolutely epic the bridge looked. Boy, I just couldn't be more happy. Crafting under pressure sometimes has its advantages and sometimes has its disadvantages. And there are times that I get burnt out and there's times that I love it. And this is just one of those times where another project paid off. I just could not be more pleased with the final result. But not a whole lot else to say in this video other than I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing, leave me a like, comment down below. Share this video with a friend that you think would enjoy it. That's the best way to help a small YouTube channel out. And most importantly, don't forget to make more terrain because I'm thinking about the mini act thing, but seriously, make more stuff. It's good. You, I enjoy it. This outro went to heck in a handbasket in like two seconds, but that's where we are. Thank you so much for watching. Until next week, I'll be seeing you.